Hey, Mark, how are you today? I'm doing good, thanks, how are you? Good, so I'm hitting you at dinner time, but we'll have a chat yes. anyway. Yes, uh, cheers, happy dinner, and, um, and uh, pardon me for being overdressed, but for some reason I'm chilled here, even though the apartment's not cold, but I'm chilled for some reason, so. So I was thinking about our work and uh, the protests are happening not only in the US, but all over the world. Mm. And um, it's interesting because you and I have um, been very careful to distance our work from the peace movement in the 60s and say, we're not that. And yet we're having an outbreak of that all over the world. And I was thinking quite a bit about how we've messaged to people and the reason why we did that, the, the, the logical strategy behind that. Um, part of it was we're dealing with very left brain people and they're not heart centered, right? So if you speak to them from the heart, it doesn't connect because they're not connected to their own heart. So you have to connect with them with data, with logic. And say so, like this is this actually makes sense from a, a data standpoint. Um, Are you you referring to engineers or financiers? Both. Loaded question. Like, well, for those who don't know, yeah. Margaret is en engineer, former financier, and well, also financier. I, 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 I wouldn't call myself a financier so much. I was I was in venture capital. Venture capitalist. Um, but they're not very heart centered people. And yet what moves people to take action and what moves people to change is less about data and logic and more about heart. Cornel West said that, that justice is love in action. And so when we want more justice, you know, when we think about how can we be good to each other, which is the mantra of the lab, that is our research question. How good can we be to each other? Um, you can layer all sorts of things into this. Like, how can we love each other better? How can we take care of each other better? Um, justice is a way that we take care of each other better. But it's coming from a heart-centered place, not a logic-centered place. If you look back over the decades of that, um, in fact, People have been moved and gone out in the street again and again and again. And it, one of the reasons we messaged things the way we did is because it didn't work. It didn't do any good. I mean, I was in LA in the middle of the Rodney King, uh, the LA riots there. There were riots before that in 68, the year that I went to New Guinea. There were, um, um, you can just kind of go back in history again and again and again. And you and I worked on the, the Arab Spring and so on. And, mm -hmm. With, with trepidation because it's like we've seen this it's, pattern before. And so- It's not sufficient. So the, the, I would the say it's not, not sufficient. Enough. Right. The heart needs to be followed with action and it needs to be followed with, and so this is the thing in terms of the, the negative piece or positive piece, mm -hmm. because you have to push people to that point where they go, okay, we need to do something. So there's this interesting aperture, this opening right now of people saying, okay, what can we do? And what people default to are, um, surface things that are tiny baby steps, but if you don't go any further, it's just posturing. If you want to go further, and this is how we tie back to the communities that we're talking to, which is specifically business and finance. If you want to deal with, if you want to address with some, something like structural inequality, there are very concrete things that you can do. For instance, um, pay gap, right. pay inequality. Boom, you know, look at it in your organization. How, what is the gap? And people will argue, well, you know, some people are do better than others. Sure, you can have a performance differential, of course, but there needs to be a reasonable bound on that. And then and what becomes a, a systemic pattern, right? And, and that's where the data is helpful because it, it, it gives you a metric that you can be held accountable to. There's a lot of tokenism in business. There are a lot of task forces and commissions and you have token people there who have a seat, but it isn't, all it results in is a report. It doesn't result in action. 
And yet, if we look yeah. inside the enterprise or in government or anything, we can say, and I think this is where the SDGs actually come in very helpful because that gives you a framework and say, okay, how do I operationalize that? How do I operationalize peace? How do I operationalize everyday uh, justice, everyday equality in ways that matter to people's lives? One of the ways that, so, I mean, first of all, what was distinctive about, about our approach was we had a new way of measuring peace at the basis of yeah. all of this. Mm -hmm. What that then, get, so that automatically took us in a quantitative direction and that was also, there are all sorts of other people doing amazing work out there um, who are coming at it much more from the uh, policy diplomacy side of things, from, from mm -hmm. the, um, uh, uh, the community health side of things, even the, the sort of the public consensus side of things, governance. Um, and, uh, and then also from the, the sort of justice side of things, and I, I want to make sure we come back to the justice side of things because we have a, a different take on that than most people are used to. Um, but the, you know, the thing that got us into this space was, oh, we have a new way to measure the underlying phenomena of how people actually behave to each other. And, right. and that measurement is suddenly about to go to scale. There's suddenly going to be rulers everywhere in the environment. And so, hey, maybe we could use that. We, um, and so our approach was quantitative from the beginning. Um, that also meant that for people who were trying to design interventions, mm -hmm. they could begin to use the measurement and the data to, bear, to have a very tight feedback loop on their intervention design to see, right. is this really moving the needle? Does it really work? Because we are not the only ones who have seen that there are many, many um, stories that sound really good. It sounds, well, that sounds like an obvious thing to do. This sounds like it would really help. Of, of course that would work. It's so logical, et cetera. And it's not until you go and do it that right. you see, oh, it not only doesn't work, it makes it worse, you know? Right, um, sure. So the, um, there was a speaker here in Palo Alto, there was a rally that, that we attended, and um, it was a retired judge, uh, LaDoris Cornell, Stanford Law School grad, African-American woman, and she was using, drawing on the analogy of COVID as a pandemic, and it's disproportionately hitting people of color. Um, and you can be infected with COVID and not know it. We know that there are many, many more cases of asymptomatic COVID than uh, being sick with it, visibly sick. And she said, racism is also a pandemic and you can have asymptomatic racism and not know it, right? This implicit racism and you're not even aware of it. I thought that was a wonderful way of, of putting it. It's like you can have it in you and not know it. It made me think of how we need to think about ethics and bias and all of these things at the very beginning rather than after the fact. Um, you know, one of the, the dilemmas that people have, especially when you have this sunk cost, you put so much time into developing something and then someone says, oh, you have to fix it. And so they kind of tack it on at the end, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really stick because not, it's not integrated into the whole system. And, and so they're little band-aids and the band, you know how band-aids are, they fall off eventually. Yeah. So changing the way we think about these things and flipping it and saying like, okay, how do we create a more moral, more just world um, and not do it after the fact. The, the system works perfectly for the outcomes that we're getting. So when we talk about, is the system broken? Well, the system was designed for these outcomes and it's working extremely well. So it's not about fixing the system because the system is, is, was tuned for this. It is imagining a new system that operates differently, that can get the outcomes. If I was an engineer and I was designing a system that consistently gave me errors, yeah. I, I, I would be fired. I would go like, no, 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 you know, <laughs> build a new machine. This machine keeps, you know, it, it, keep, it doesn't function. No funciona, right? It keeps breaking. It keeps giving me a default, defective product. Um, and yet, if, if I tolerate it, then that must mean that perhaps the faulty product is not faulty after all. It's exactly what we intended it to do. It's either doing what we designed it to do, or we have set our expectations so low for government that... Uh... We, but we it's also for society. Products actually, yeah, but it's right, right now it is, 
right now these products are handled by government. You know, peace as a service in the ecosystem and the economy is handled by government. And let's, you know, we have very low expectations from our governments. Let's be clear on that. They generally don't perform well. Um, I think there's a there's an interesting um, dialectic between the sort of the heart and the reason. Um, I think it's part of what I love about our approach is that it is so quantitative, it is so measurable, it is so logical. We really can see what's working and what isn't. We can help any any practitioner, any designer quickly see is your design going to work or not before you spend all the time and the money and energy to build it. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, we can help the super passionate people. I guess one of the things I'm so nervous about is, is um, again and again and again in my life, I have seen people who care deeply about a cause and who are willing to dedicate their whole lives to it and willing to, willing to sacrifice all sorts of things to it. Um, and they come up with a plausible narrative, a narrative that sounds good, sounds compelling, sounds convincing. And because they're so passionate about it, they go follow through on that narrative without actually measuring those, is this really helping or is it making it worse? And, you know, I was involved in one of those things early in my life, in my formative years of my career in, in the famine in, in Ethiopia and Sudan, where um, in spite of sincerely good people with the best intentions in the world and with a bunch of fashion men who made huge sacrifices and everything. And in spite of that, we made it worse because we didn't have good measurement. So um, 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 those, the tension between the using the part of our neurology that is story driven and narrative driven, using that in a positive way, but also adding in a layer of, here's how we keep on checking, is this story really true? Does does this hypothesis really work? Does this thing that sounds good actually work in practice? Um, and having a, a having a way for the rational part of our brains, the the um, the logical part of our brains, and the part of our brains that go, that says, well, um, let's test this, and then let's be really honest about the results of our test because it could save us not only tons of resources, it could save us harm and blood and lives and so on, right? You know and agony in society. So um, part of what I love about our approach is the sort of the merger of those two things. It, it creates the opportunity for an informed heart, I would say, as opposed to, um, uh, and it brings sort of the best of the engineering world that in the last two centuries has really helped us as a species go from a whole bunch of mythology and a whole bunch of really compelling stories where people were willing to die for those stories, even though when you actually go measure the output of the story, the reality and the story are completely opposite in some cases. Um, and, where, and engineering became this discipline, this professional practice of you have to actually make something that actually works. If it doesn't actually work, you failed, start again, you know, repeat until it works. Um, I really like how we've managed to merge both of those things and get the best of both of those worlds. I want to give the, the compelling narrative and people working from an open heart, I want to give that both the support and the skepticism it deserves. And then the, the totally non-passionate, quantitative, computational, just technology, just hardware, just tools, just business, I want to give that approach both the support and the skepticism that it deserves as well, right? So so. Um, and I want people to notice that um, in control theory, uh, in a lot of social theory, there's quite a bit of evidence that says, you know, if you're the dictator and you want to remain the dictator, um, and whenever people get upset, whenever the masses, the populace, whoever they are, whenever they get upset enough, you arrange for them to go break some things, get together and demonstrate, blow off steam, et cetera, and you let them punch the wind until they're exhausted. Um, and then they get to go home and they get to feel like we all got together, we did something, we were important, we, you know. Uh, but now they're worn out, they go home and the system continues as ever and they got to walk away with a good feeling. And the people in control are like, all we have to do is give them the good feeling that they did something and then we can keep on however we want, right? Um, and th there are certainly governments all over the world that have been doing that for decades, if not centuries. Um, so the heart's not enough. The heart's not enough. You got to have tools. You got to have 
instruments of power. And part of what we're in here is this really interesting shift where the tools of power, uh, the, tool, the means of production, um, and the means of influence are being massively democratized. And we're in the midst of that era, right? The flip side of that is that the tools that do really work that both governments and big corporations use, we know this from our work with BJ over the years, studying persuasive technology, is that um, these are profoundly dispassionate tools that don't engage the narrative part of your brain at all, don't engage the conscious part of your brain at all, but um, scale up to massively change behavior, massively and powerfully change behavior in ways that have never been done before. Um, and they're being used by governments uh, largely to get people to be good citizens, which means sit down, shut up, do what you're told, don't ask questions. And they're being used by companies largely to get people to be good consumers, which means sit down, shut up, pull out your wallet, buy the crap I'm selling you and tell your friends that they should buy it too, right? Um, and neither of those futures are futures that any of any normal person wants to live in or want their children to inherit, right? So um, those tools have been profoundly democratized. And a big part of our work is teaching people who are sincerely led from a good place in their heart how to start using those tools also to change the world at scale in a measurably positive way. You know, when I think about redlining and I think about home ownership and I think about how people of color were, le were intentionally left out of the GI Bill, um, intentionally left out of access to healthcare, intentionally excluded from these things, and they have real um, consequences economically. Um, in terms of business, we, you know, there's all, there are all kinds of levels of justice. And, um, there's all sorts of violence that you can do to people in terms of economic violence, right? You don't actually, you know, obviously there's physical violence. There's no question about that. You can take someone's life, you can maim them, you can injure them. You can also injure them intergenerationally by denying people economic opportunity. Absolutely. And keeping them in poverty, right? And, and businesses have, you know, it's part of it is for them to look at how they have unconsciously done that it's sort of like um being aware of um what privilege gives you because certainly what people with privilege say like oh but i've suffered it's not like that you that you haven't suffered is that you have you have not suffered additionally mm -hmm. right there, there there every everyone has hardships that they need to go through but you don't have an additional load of hardship right uh, and that's what what privilege is about is that you're not you're not additionally burdened with these other things and that gives you the advantage that other people don't have and um, how does how does business un, un, unconsciously perpetuate privilege i mean so for instance here we go if we look at, at uh mobile payments mm -hmm. that perpetuates privilege for people who have a bank account who are banked who have a credit card if you are part of the population that is unbanked, who don't have a credit rating, you are excluded from that economy. You are excluded from the benefits that come from that. If you're coming from that place of privilege, well, every I, I have a you know I have a credit card and I have a bank account and I do all these things and I can do it online. It wouldn't be great to do it mobily. Um, that problem is completely invisible to you in your experience. And, and as we accelerate digital payment and mobile payment, that creates these divides, right? And that's, 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 that's privilege in action, but it's not, it's, it wasn't malicious on your part, it's just that you weren't aware because you just thought everyone had access to this. Jimmy Kimmel, a couple nights mm -hmm. ago, gave mm -hmm. this, what I thought was a brilliant definition of white privilege, which is just, you know, we don't notice that we're not being constantly doubted and constantly um, double checked and constantly um, uh, suspected mm -hmm. because of the color of our skin. Like that, yeah. that's what, you know, the Catholic church has this lovely term, sins of omission, you know? Mm -hmm. The good thing you should have done that you didn't do. And there's an equivalent of that, which is a, an, an oppression of omission where, or, or a, um, a privilege of omission. I never realized I was privileged because that bad thing just never happened to me. 
Right. And, and it doesn't happen to me multiple times a day, you know, and, and because right. it doesn't happen to me multiple times a day, I'm still very aware of all the struggles and all the, all the battles that I fight and everything else in other domains. So I don't feel privileged, but, but when I think about it a little bit, then I can realize, oh, and there's this whole other layer of battle multiple times a day with every person that I interact with who has a different level of melatonin in their skin than I do, who suspects me just because of the color of my skin or, or who is extra suspicious or extra nervous or extra fearful or extra whatever, just because I tan well, you know, um, that's, and, and, and it's a, it's an experience that white people aren't having. And because they're not having it, they're not aware of it. And because they're not having it or aware of it, it's unless they imagine the situation and go, Oh, Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, when I was pulling up at McDonald's the other night and this black guy pulled up ahead of me and I was slightly nervous and slightly jumpy, oh yeah, I was doing that to him right then and I sure wasn't feeling privileged in that moment, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's those kind of moments where the hard stuff happens and yeah. where so, because of a, 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 just because we haven't had deep empathy training yet, Peter, Peter Singer's circle of uh, expanding compassion hasn't quite hit that state yet. Unless, unless we deliberately, intentionally imagine how did that feel on, on behalf of the other person, um, we don't see it. We're blind to it. Absolutely. I mean, when I was growing up, the I grew up in a in a, a white dominant community. Um, we were one of the few Hispanic families there. I was very aware of Clan racism. Clan T. It's you know it has the name that nickname for a reason. And um, the highest compliment we would be paid was we weren't like the other Mexicans. Mm. And um, it's like, well, what do you mean by that? And uh, because we were acceptable, we weren't yeah. offensive, we didn't trigger whatever it was, whatever stereotypes, but we were still not equal to them. Right. I mean, right. it's like, yeah, we, were, we were tolerable. <laughs> Right. right? Um, not as bad as what, right, know, not as bad, yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. tolerable, or you would get pity. You would get progressive pity of like, oh, well, you're so disadvantaged. Let me help you out. And, um, and so you would get access to things, but it was coming from a place of pity rather than from a place of um, worthiness. And so it was yeah. tainted that way as well. Um, and that's something that, and then it's funny because I was very aware of the racism in San Diego. It's a conservative community and certainly in the 60s and 70s, um, the divide was between uh, Anglo and Hispanic. Um, and then coming to Northern California, I felt such a relief from the racism and then I ran into the sexism. Let's put it this way, if I did experience the racism, it wasn't as in my face as the sexism was. The sexism, I was, my nose was rubbed in it. Give people the context of women in tech in Silicon Valley. Most people oh. who haven't been in tech in Silicon Valley are unaware of it. Well, no, I mean, uh, women in tech in Silicon Valley sucks, but being a minority in tech sucks as well. I mean, it's both. Um, right, right. And, so you get um, the double whammy, but most people aren't aware that the women in tech thing is a thing unless they've been yeah. in tech and experienced it. Well, also the women in tech thing is much more vocal than people of color because it's white women. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you think about uh, feminism, it tends to be more a white woman thing. And so they can agitate for that. Um, if it was, you know, Hispanic women in tech, nobody's gonna talk about that, much less black women in tech. Um, but we say women in tech, we're really talking about privileged, um, white women who went to Stanford or Harvard Business School and they're, they're not getting access, to be honest. Um, but the racism here is more subtle. Um, the Anglo populace, it's diverse. You go, ah, okay, you're privileging other people. So you're privileging uh, people who come from the upper caste of India who have PhDs who are advantaged, right? You're, you're privileging Asians who have come from very advantaged families in China. Um, you're not, so it's, it's it, from a class standpoint, you're still dealing with your peers, even though they're right, right. different colored, but you're, you're ancient, not dealing ancient with- Ancient trading families that have been leading for- Exactly, exactly. Um, 
the but the the racism in in is still here it's just that it's it's a it's a distance in class and income and so on from our perspective from our models we would look at all of those things as just difference boundaries all a bunch of different sets of difference boundaries and um, right and some can be transcended and some can't um and so the the racism in the valley is is much more subtle um the sexism is is um having who is supposedly your mentor telling you that you're talented but you're not going to get anywhere in the organization and they're not an ally because they're actually not going to expend any social capital to change that fact and it's more like and i remember getting these conversations when i was in my 20s and even in my 30s, going like, well, you know, you're really smart and talented and you have a great resume, but you're not going to get anywhere here. And it's like, oh, wow, thank you very much, you know. Um, we, won't, we won't name any company names, but yeah, and, and the person on the other side of the desk is maybe thinking, and I'm doing you a favor by telling you this, I'm saving you time. And trouble. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> they thought they were doing me a great favor, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't do me the favor of actually changing the system. Right, right. Or of actually standing up and saying, you know what, this is systemic and this is wrong. This is not fair. I'm willing to fight this but, battle on your behalf. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. It was more like suck it up. Yeah. And so I certainly had that throughout my career. And then the, the other thing that happens are the opportunities that you don't get and you don't realize that you don't get them. Yeah, exactly. You never saw them right. in the first place. You they never saw never them in the first place. The first place. Yeah. Right. So but even if people you, tell you that you're amazing and talented and everything else, you go, well, if that's the case, why isn't anyone beating a path to my door? It's like, ah, okay, got it. You know, because you're not you've, in you've the actually, circles. You've you've experienced this in a way that most people haven't because of the circles that you do move in. You you get invited into the room. You get invited to the table. You get invited to the board, um, and then you look around the room when you get there, and you realize, oh, I'm the token minority. Mm -hmm. I'm the, I'm the token woman, or the token Latino, or the token Native American, or the you know. Um, so they get to tick a box, and then. They won't actually uh, let you have any influence. They won't actually, um, you know, if you're the senior executive, you're the token senior executive who for some reason has no budget, no reports, no authority, but lots of responsibility, you know? And it's just like, it's just slavery again, but at a kind of a higher economic level where um, you are getting taken care of. You're the house slave, you know, the house Negro. Um, There's a lot of tokenism everywhere in corporate America. Um, and it's tough because you're trying to, to break in. And so that's, it feels like it, when you, from the, the other side, it feels like an, that's an accomplishment in and of itself just to get in the room. Uh, but if you're the only voice, what you say will not be heard. Yeah. Um, they've let you in the room in order to justify not letting other people in the room. And they've let right. you in the room in order to actually keep other people from wanting to get in the room. And yeah, that's- Well, because then they say like, hey, our job here is done. We did, we did the one, you know, the, the, the female no, slot. Now, now we're good people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's- is our, our colleague at Berkeley that did the work on how right. um, people of privilege behave even worse once they've done the one little thing that makes them think they now they're justified to do that. So. Right, right, right. Because then you get a pass on everything else. Yeah. Um, and that and that's a real issue and it's tough um, because you don't want to get played as a token. You're actually sincerely there to do the work and to have an impact where and when you can. Mm -hmm. um, and also the flip side of it is if you're too outspoken, you get you get kicked out. And so then you go like, I can't there's the, the, the impact that I have inside the organization is zero if I'm outside of the organization how we deal with healthcare in this country and having it tied to employers uh, again creates a caste system because not all employers provide health care if you're a small business providing health care is really really expensive yeah. it's super it's one thing if you hire a hundred thousand people it's another thing if you hire 10. and and when you look at employment in this country there's a long tail of small businesses most people work for a small company you know, uh, if you're elite, yeah, you can work for a Google or a Facebook or something like that hi that hires thousands of employees that can afford health insurance. Most companies don't have that. So that creates another um, barrier and it keeps people impoverished. So how do we um, 
detach healthcare from employment or from the employer, right? Um, that would make a difference in terms of the systemic injustice. When you look at COVID and how it's disproportionately hitting, you know, African Americans and Latinos, and we're in essential mm -hmm. jobs. And Native Americans, massively. And Native Americans. And, and Native Americans. I mean, don't even talk about Native yeah. Americans. You know. What's well, hitting uh, so hard on the reservations now? Yeah. yeah. So, so there, 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 but but there are concrete things that you, that people can start doing today. In hiring practices, in recruiting. Um, how you do uh, promotions, how do you, and if, you, if you're thinking about, you know, our live Christmas, how good can we be to each other? Even in the enterprise, how do you design the culture so that we can be as supportive of each other as possible and aligning our practices around that? Um, you know, when you look at the um, income gap between employees and executives, if you look at how much Jeff Bezos makes, I mean, yeah, there's, yeah. You know, Paul Sapo was writing um, uh, in sing, uh, the Singularity University blog this morning about a moral economy yeah. and looking at models of a moral economy. And this is pre-industrial revolution where right. um, in a peasant economy, they go like, how do we set a fair wage? How do we set a fair price? Because we are mutually interdependent and it does me no good to see you suffer um, because next year I might be the one who's suffering. So we need to take care of each other. And so it's a, it's a, it's a way of managing risk in the community. Yeah, exactly. And so if we move toward a moral capitalistic economy, we might look at wages differently. We might look at healthcare differently and say like, no, we, we want to actually create a floor. So I think this is a good place to wrap. We've been talking for a bit. Oh no, I've got like six other things I want to get to. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, no, we have a business meeting coming up, don't we? Uh, we do have a business meeting coming up, but this has been a great, great conversation. And I look forward to talking to you again. Me too. Me too. Always okay. a pleasure. Okay. okay. Take care. Bye.